it's 7.06 GMT. This is Weekends from the BBC World Service with me, Celia. Hey guys, so radio, uh, navigation, aviation, uh, communication, all of those things are really, really important, especially in the world of uh, aviation. Because today, as you know, uh, whether it's in your panel, whether it's just the two-way radio communications that you use when you're communicating with uh, air-to-ground, air-to-air, ATC, whatever, we need radio to work. Um, in fact, if it wasn't for radio or radio technology and two-way communications using electromagnetic energy, None of what we do today in technology would probably function. There would be no social media because the device that you're using even today requires uh, electromagnetic energy, for short radio communications, to actually function. And it's such interesting science and I, I guess because of my background and formal education which involves some physics and math and electronics, I have a fair amount of interest in understanding uh, electromagnetic energy, RF energy and I tinker with radios and radio technology whenever I get time free. But what's really really interesting is a, the application of RF technology in aviation. And of course we can think of communications but we also think of uh, navigation. So there are two incarnations of uh, navigation systems that predate uh, GPS, which do not rely on radio technology for navigation. And those are commonly referred to as the INS, the Inertial Navigation System, and also the IRS, the Inertial Reference System. So let's go to the beach. I want to show you something there. Um, and I'm just going to use the beach as my whiteboard and explain to you guys what, uh, how some of these systems function in very, very basic terms. And also want to cover the topic of uh, ring lasers, because ring lasers have a key role to play in the IRS, the Inertial Reference System. So let's head to the beach. Cape Town is a coastal city with Mediterranean climate. It's renowned for its white sandy beaches, wineries, mountains, uh, Table Mountain and the uh, Table Mountain National Reserve. Both the climate as well as the quality of the soil makes this a very desirable location for uh, growing some of the world's best wines. And it's also a very popular tourist destination for travelers all over the world. Well, it's a beautiful morning here in Cape Town, South Africa, and behind me is the Atlantic Ocean. So I'm here at uh, 34 South, it's the southernmost part of the African continent, and uh, just returned from Alaska. So the advances in radio technology is really, really exciting. There's so much science and technology that's made it into mainstream uh, radio technology and that's of course applied in the communications field for the most part. So long range navigation, uh, you may ask why it's not 100% based on radio technology like GPS for example. Well, did you know that uh, for the longest time long haul flights and navigation across the oceans relied on other systems besides GPS and even before GPS. Come along as I go check out some of this technology and what it's done for aviation. Right, top at 610 Los Angeles Tower, you're following 737, five miles ahead, right 24, right clear land. But before we get into any of the details of these systems, which is really exciting, of course, let's look at some of the basics of navigation. There are five basic forms of navigation. Pilotage, which essentially relies on landmarks for knowing where you are. Dead reckoning, relying on the information of knowing what your starting point is, plus then some form of heading information and speed information to get you to your destination. Then there's celestial navigation, using the time and angles between local and vertical known celestial objects like, uh, for example, the sun, some of the stars, and by doing that, by using that information, you can triangulate and use all sorts of um, uh, mathematics and um, to figure out your position. Radio navigation, which of course is a fun one, which includes all the forms of airborne, ground-based, terrestrial, uh, external navigation systems, internal, coupled with internal systems that allows you to find your way around the globe. 
Of course, the most popular and common form of that is just the GPS uh, global positioning system. But there's also other p parts of the navigation systems, like, for example, the um, instrument landing system or the instrument navigation system, including some of the instrument landing uh, capabilities, which is a form of navigation and relies heavily on uh, ground-based uh, equipment providing uh, very high resolution information and coupled with in cockpit uh, navigation and steering equipment to guide your way to the runway or down the glide path or whatever the case may be. And then there's inertial navigation systems. Inertial navigation systems relies only on the information of your initial position but beyond that point it requires no external input uh, by either radio or reference to landmarks or reference to celestial systems. It is totally autonomous. It's mounted inside of the airplane and can figure out its way um, across the globe uh, by just using uh, the initial uh, position fix. And we're going to get into a little bit of these systems because that's really fascinating. And it re relies on a technology that we might not all be aware of, but it's really uh, cool how this works and how accurate all of this can uh, function. Arnav Del Rey, one two six zero four, runway two four left at Echo Seven, clear for takeoff. Arnav Del Rey, two four left, Echo Seven, clear for takeoff. And so long before GPS was a thing, uh, international flights, especially the ones uh, crossing the oceans, they had to rely on navigation systems that were accurate and reliable enough that could get them across the oceans. Uh, to their destination. So there are a few systems that were put in place that has nothing to do with radio technology. Not entirely nothing, but it's kind of disconnected from the radio systems and especially the advances with GPS technology. So prior to GPS there were systems, the systems that were installed in uh, long-haul aircraft were known as inertial navigation systems, INS. And there's an upgrade to the INS, the inertial uh, navigation system, that's known as the inertial reference system. So both the inertial navigation and the inertial reference system make use of a closed system, enclosed system of essentially uh, three axis accelerometers that when calibrated properly, when installed properly and initialized properly, it allows this enclosed system to be autonomous in detecting its movement, meaning its velocity and direction of this velocity. So once we initialize this unit to its starting point, the unit from that point on it knows the distance and the velocity with which it is traveling. So if you add a little bit of math, then you can figure out the distance and the direction that the system has traveled from the point that it was initialized or from its initial position. Now the inertial navigation system essentially employed uh, three axis accelerometers which are three gyros that detect the relative uh, acceleration along these three axes and with that information can determine its velocity and direct direction of movement. One of the problems with gyro based systems is the phenomena or the artifact of precession. A gyro given enough time will lose its position and will drift essentially which of course leads to errors being introduced in the system. So gyros work really well, but they do drift and of course the accuracy of that system therefore is not sufficient for long durations of uh, autonomous work. Now fast forward to the inertial reference system. Same concept, three axis of accelerometers, but in this case instead of using gyro based accelerometers, or gyro stabilized accelerometers. The scientists have figured out how to employ light and use the properties of light to achieve essentially the same uh, result. Here's the fascinating part. They essentially swapped out the gyro accelerometers and replaced it with ring lasers. Now the ring laser and the concept of a ring laser is what fascinates me tremendously and the fact that they could employ light energy and use light energy or photon energy to solve uh, this kind of a problem. So here goes, let me uh, give you guys a quick explanation of what a ring laser is and how it functions and, and why in particular it comes to good use in trying to solve this acceleration problem. So I'm gonna use some of these bamboo to try and explain what's going on. There's one half of the circle. Here's another half of a circle. So imagine this is a circle and these are tubes that are conducive to conducting laser energy. So these are hollow tubes 
and if you shoot a laser into this tube it'll actually propagate and follow the shape of the circles likewise on this side as well so just imagine for now that this is perfectly circular so here's the concept of a ring laser at one side these tubes are open and laser sources are inserted one on the right side one on the left side so just imagine for now when you light up the laser the light is going to travel along this tube will eventually get all around all the way to the other side and the same by the same token on this side if i shoot the laser into this side it's going to follow the curvature of the tube and will go around in a circle now imagine that i have a sensor i have two sensors on the opposite sides here where i'm pointing that are able to detect the 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 light and the speed and whatever time it arrives there i have one sensor there and one sensor there so if i shoot the laser at exactly these two lasers at exactly the same time one is going around the left and one is going around the right theoretically they should arrive at this opposite point exactly the same moment in time which is true uh, for the most part if this system stays static but here's the um, here's the, the here's the really smart thing about a ring laser system and how it functions just imagine and i'm going to exaggerate that between the time that i fire the first signal going left going right this system actually rotates because my plane is banking or pitching and so i'm going to exaggerate and the system all of a sudden looks like that okay so i've drawn this out all right so if you look at it on paper if these are the sources from where i shoot the laser the the laser beam that goes on the left would have traveled all this distance and would have reached that let's say in one second the other one that travels from the on the right hand side would have traveled all the, all the way around equal distance would have reached that point at time one second now let's look at the scenario where this whole system has been rotated and what happens to those light signals so, as opposed to the previous example where my injection point of the laser is here i start here and then as the system rotates the whole the, this whole closed unit rotates to the right so you end up with a laser that was initially fired here having to travel this distance on the right hand side and the other the left hand side laser which was originally fired here would have had to travel all this way around the left around the left it would have been at the one second mark there which was my original top but now i've moved this tube and i've essentially lengthened this tube to here so the left hand laser would have had to travel all the distance to the 12 o'clock position and beyond the laser on the right side, however, would have had to travel only from the six o'clock position, let's say, to the three o'clock position. Obviously a way shorter distance. So this one arrives at that point way sooner than the other one arrives at that point, which is essentially the original 12 o'clock position, plus come around almost to the three o'clock. So there's a delta in the arrival time of those laser beams at this point. And essentially the system with applying the right amount of math can figure out the left hand side took a longer route arrived later than the right hand side so this system must have twisted the system must have rotated so with the correct amount of math applied you can say that within this plane that this system is mounted it's experienced a rotation between the time that you've obviously fired the first la the lasers and the arrival time so you can read back and you can do this continuously and you can detect the minute amount of la of rotation with this system and again this is a closed system uh, referred to as a ring laser now as you can imagine in an aircraft we need to measure three axes so you have one of these systems in each of the three axes which are perpendicular to each other and this is how the IRS system is able to employ ring lasers to detect acceleration and direction of acceleration over time all right so there's my very rudimentary ring laser tube system there was the original system and here's the uh, modified one that one that's undergone some uh, angular or some rotation angular movement is another way of saying that so let me know if you like uh, content like this if you like for me to do more radio thanks for watching guys thanks for following along if you're watching this on youtube please subscribe and consider hitting the notify button because that'll keep you up to date uh, when i release more videos and stories like this see ya